Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. And you're very welcome along to a fairly sombre Friday Night Racing this Friday afternoon for you here. And every Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. Uh, Johnny Ward, good afternoon to you. How are you? Hello, Joe. How are you? Um, the funeral is actually taking place. It started at 2 o'clock, and so the, the burial and the removal are on right now. And just to, to get a sense of it, you know, obviously in the time of COVID, families aren't being given the comfort of the big funerals. This would have been one of the biggest funerals, I suspect, in Ireland this or any other year for somebody as popular as Pat Smullen to be taken so young after... Uh, raising so much money and profile for pancreatic cancer and cancer research, you just know that it would have been huge. And I'm, I'm scrolling through the notices, the condolences on RIP.ie, and like, it's so tragic. Yeah, the the RIP.ie feature. Um, you know, I actually I kind of got to know it when um, a, a person at home died this year, and it is a beautiful thing that you can in these times that um, if you're not able to go to the funeral that you can leave um, you know your personal message of condolence and um, I'd imagine if they uh, copy and pasted and printed out the ones that are on Pat Mullins page and um, you could probably make a book out of it there will be that many because that was the respect that racing had for him and obviously a lot more than that as well he was um, a true Irish sporting icon by the end of his life um, primarily for what he'd actually achieved outside of the saddle because racing as, as much as we all love it Still a small enough sport, I suppose, in, in the overall scheme of things. And um, Pat Mullen definitely came to the fore in terms of national prominence, in terms of, you know, being struck down by a horrific illness in his early 40s and having the fortitude not only to fight it, but to, um, you know, raise so much money for pancreatic cancer and um, research. And, you know, I, I was given a message today from somebody just on about that fundraising and... Um, when he got his second diagnosis, they were in the early stages of planning a fundraising weekend and Pat and Francis, um, they took about two weeks out to kind of get their head around what was almost likely, almost certainly going to be like, you know, a fatal kind of blow for Pat. But they went straight back into the fundraising straight afterwards. And, you know, I was obviously speaking to you during the week uh, after Pat passed away and I didn't know, you know, that what Johnny Murch revealed after winning the Matron Stakes on Saturday um, with Champers Elise, he got a text from Pat Smullen. And uh, I, I, I mean, what we shouldn't probably lose sight of as well is how much he suffered. He absolutely suffered. He suffered awful, awful illness. He suffered pain. He suffered the mental pain of knowing that he was going away. And through all of this, he was texting Johnny Murch to congratulate him on Saturday probably realising that he would be dead himself within the next few days, which he was, and today is a, is a horrible day for, for, for Irish racing, really. Dermot Wells said the same thing. They were getting texts as well uh, at the weekend of Champions Weekend, celebrating the fact that those horses were winning, and, you know, in an alternative reality, he would have been on some of them. Absolutely. He would have had a very good run of it of late, um, you know, because Dermot's horses have really hit form, and uh, Pat was... He was just top class as a rider, you know. Uh, he, he'd probably uh i suppose he'd met somebody as hungry as he was for success in Wells, who he had on last friday and who spoke so glowingly of of uh, pat and um, uh, you know and it's always difficult for jockeys when they're injured and they look at uh you know jockeys riding winners that they should be riding but it takes on a completely different um personality altogether when when you know that you know you're not going to be riding again and uh he he even had a few spells riding out at dermot's when uh after his diagnosis and it's just, uh, I don't know, it's just very hard to, to get one's head around it. I think uh, it'll come to the fore subsequently how strong his wife, Frances, is. She's from, you know, an amazing racing family, that of Joe Crowley. And, you know, they're steeped in racing. But uh, I suppose my own um, experience of Frances is just, you know, as much as she was a classic winning trainer, the way she's dealt with this, along with Pat, has been quite amazing, really. And uh, uh, the three kids will, will, will have a, a mother that'll, you know, help them through this because it's, um, I'm just speculating as to how horrible it, it must be. And, um, you know, life begins for Irish racing now post Pat Smullen. And that, that's for me is a very strange place for us to be in. Look, we, we, we've um, been paying uh, tribute to him all week here on the show. And we're going to hear from Dermot Weld in a moment. We'll hear from Johnny Marta 
and uh, we'll hear from Fran Berry, one of his best friends. But we actually did speak with Pat back in April 2019. John Malloy went down and sat with him in his home and spent a, a good couple of hours. And uh, if you get the opportunity to go back and look at it, I think like all of these things in sport, we tend to get very singular views of the people who are involved. Cardboard cutouts in some respects, unless actually you get the opportunity to to come at this from a different angle. And obviously with the, the downtime that Pat Smullen had, this is about 18 months ago now, he, we really did get the opportunity to kind of get to know him a little bit better. So this is when he was still recovering and receiving treatment. And in this short clip of that interview, he talks here about how the illness changed his life perspective. Have a look. I thought my Not job was same. very important and yeah. I thought I was a very important person <laughs> and I thought... Uh, well, Dee doesn't have a handwritten note from Bono on her <laughs> toilet, you know. <laughs> well, she, she deserves one, but, um, you know, I, I, you know, as I said, you, you go around in a, in a bubble, don't you? You think sure. that you're, 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 you're very important in the job that you're doing, and it is, it's a big business, don't get me wrong, but, but when... when when something like this happens, and I was a very selfish person, you know, you know, towards my wife and the kids, and to me it was all about riding horses and winning races and and delivering on on the day for for the owners and the trainers, and uh, and and I was to, to be honest a little bit obsessed with it, and uh, uh, but by God, does this not open your eyes to what is important in life, and you know what the surgeons do, what the oncologists do, what the nurses do. I mean, they're heroes. I mean, mm. they're, you know, what, as you say, what sporting people do is very, very entertaining for a lot of people and a lot of people get enjoyment out of it. But when your back is against the wall and it's a serious situation, you know, these people don't get half enough recognition. And, but they're, they're, they don't want recognition. They're just yeah. doing their job, which is amazing. Whereas, uh, you know, you get a little bit uh, complacent yourself and think this is great all this you know, applaud that you get for winning races, and yeah. but uh, no, it's uh, it will open my eyes to what life is actually about. Uh, it was interesting what you said to, to round things off about um, selfishness. Yeah, and um, there are different. You know, we talk to different categories of sports people on the show all the time, and there can be the the Simon Zebo, Jamie Heaslip types who barely watch the sport and are relaxed and rock up on game day and do their thing and can park it. I think you're more in the Roy Keane, obsessive, driven, 24-7, am I good enough, self-critical. You're on that stress wheel. Very much so. Yeah. Unfortunately, I was, yeah. What's it like been getting off that? I appreciate in the midst of a difficult time, but has it been interesting to, for the first time probably in your adult life, come away from yeah. that hamster wheel? I've actually, de you know, dealt with it well, better than Francis thought I would. Right. Uh, my family and friends, I think they thought because I wasn't going to be able to ride that this could be not good for me, you know what I mean? That uh, how mentally how I'm going to cope with it. But uh, I've surprised myself as well in that. But when you're faced with something as serious as, as what I, I, I had to face, um, I think reality comes into play mm. and then you realise how important uh, w what you're facing is rather than what you have been doing for the last 25 years. But uh, but that said that that was me and that that's how I uh, that's how I'd like to think that's why I was successful was because I gave it everything and uh, when there was obviously you know better riders than me my I think my work ethic my dedication and my uh, determination to succeed uh, overcame mm. the lack of maybe ability in places and uh, and, and I think that that was very very important for me to 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 be to to to, to be to make it a, a success and. Uh, and thankfully, I think it has been. That's Pat Smullen back in April 2019 speaking with Joe Malloy. That full um, video is up on our, our YouTube channel and uh, definitely worth having a look. Um, you know, Johnny, we talk all the time about how singular and determined all of these jockeys have to be to get to the absolute pinnacle of their sport, which is exactly where Pat Smullen was. And it's always interesting to hear them kind of say that, um, you know, you, you, you sometimes have regrets about not making the time for your family. Pat did get the time to um, make time for his family and did get the time to kind of have that realisation. Yeah, I was, uh, was in Tala last night and, you know, absolutely marvelling at Zlatan Ibrahimovic at his age, you know, the just the brilliance of the man and how at that stage of his career he could be um, still so good and just be that different gear to, you know, even players in his own team at times. And um, I suppose that's reflective of somebody looking after himself and Pat was really really driven in his career and uh, I, I think uh, he 
he's absolutely, you know, a person who just told it as it is. And I think when he said he was selfish there, he completely meant it. And um, the wives and girlfriends of um, the, the top jockeys, they have an awful lot to put up with. It's, you know, they're probably miserable to be around a lot of the time, particularly those who are not, um, you know, who have to struggle to do weights. And uh, I think the people at home, have uh, they, they don't have it easy and I don't think Francis Crowley had it easy when, when Pat was alive and riding um, as much as he was you're traveling an awful lot not particularly glamorous either you know and um, I imagine Pat's mood would have been a little bit swayed by how he got on at the track and again he was very honest in that he, he you know he wasn't necessarily the most talented rider even of his generation but he was he just worked on it um, but I think genuinely that you know as much as it was a horrible way for him to find out it gave him the realization that with three young kids and with a, a wife that there was more to life than racing. Um, but I suppose the flip side of that is what helped make him as good as he was was the fact that he was just so single-minded and tunnel-visioned into making it um, as a jockey. And Pat could have ridden, I mean, 43 as he passed away. I mean, easily could have ridden in, well into his late 40s and probably wouldn't have regressed much, if at all, and, you know, gotten to the stage of a Frankie de Tory or whatever and... Um, he, he he just had that hunger to do it, um, but uh, he he's very honest there. You know, it's 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 a tough game, and a lot of um, wives and families just have to kind of put up with it. And uh, that's the life of the of the top class jockey for me. Um, one thousand eight hundred and forty five winners in Ireland, forty seven in Britain, including obviously Harzand in the Epsom Derby and the Irish Derby in twenty sixteen. It was. Uh, generally for Dermot Weld that he did most of his riding he was the jockey there for um, more than two decades and uh, we spoke with Dermot Weld on Wednesday evening about the loss of his close friend and colleague have a look today has been a very very emotional day to be quite honest and I'm proud I was very proud the way all the people came out of the car today to watch the funeral cortege go by there was several hundred people out there just in our area to watch it going by if you know what I mean and stopped as you may know at the car race course and see the coffin with his oh with the with the number clause from both the Epsom and the Irish Derby of Harris and on it. The outpouring for Pat has been so striking. I mean he was an immensely popular person. Well he was a he was a fabulous individual and uh, you know his loyalty, his integrity um speaks volumes because that's the sort of man he was if you know what I mean he, he was uh, first and foremost he was a wonderful human being he was kind generous but as I said integrity and loyalty uh, have to be right up there which I, I presume is a big part of, of your long long association together 20 odd years yeah we're 20 years stable jockey here you know what I mean that, that we became wonderful friends you know we travelled the world you know some of the big race wins that he had I'd always say we went to California with a very good filly called Dress to Trill, but we went into the Lion's Den. We took on the two best turf fillies of the United States in a race called the Matriarch. And she went off third or fourth favorite, but it was a brilliant ride from Patty. Outrode the best, two best jockeys riding on the West Coast of America, and she got up to win either a head or a neck. But it was an unbelievable drive from Pat Smullen to beat the two best riders they had in America at the time. I forget who they were, Mike Smith and somebody else. I was listening to Ruby Walsh was talking somewhere this afternoon and he was making the observation that he never felt Pat was a jockey, unlike others, I suspect, a, a jockey who had, you know, tons of natural self-confidence. Mm -hmm that it was something he, he worked at and maybe yeah. um, he, he, he worked so hard maybe as a result of that. I don't know what, what your thoughts yeah, on that I think, are. Yeah, I, I think that would be fair. That would, I hope I, in some small way, helped to give him confidence. Uh, very often I just used to say, I actually remember going out from Melbourne Cup, joking him, I said, you just go out and enjoy yourself. Mm. And uh, he knew what I meant by that. Mm. But he, he would do, as I said, he would have a lot of homework done. Uh, on the opposition and this is the key he would have his horse in the position where he wanted him to be so he could deliver his challenge like he, he won the English 2000 guineas for me on a horse called Refuse to Bend which by the way I think is a very appropriate name because when Pat was diagnosed with cancer that's what he didn't do he, he refused to bend 
You said, Dermot, you became friends as well. You travelled the world together in your casual conversations on mm. flights or in cars or yeah. in helicopters. Was it always racing that you talked about or other stuff as oh, well? Oh, no, no, no. We talked about the world. We talked about life. Uh, we talked about how short life is, surprising. You know, I'm fully aware of humanity and, <laughs> you, you know, he was a very humble guy, Pat Smullen. And that was one of the lovely qualities he had. He was he was a highly respectful, humble person. And Ruby was right. He he didn't realize how good he was. That's the best way to put it. And he didn't want to realize how good he was. He was nine times champion jockey. Mm. He was at one. I would say he was unquestionably, unquestionably, in the top six riders of the world, not just of Europe. And he was in the top six of the world for many years. He said his uh, diagnosis in 2018 was like being hit with a sledgehammer, and I, I fully imagine it was. Can you give us an insight, maybe, Dermot, into how he dealt with the last two years of his life? I think he dealt exceptionally well with the last two years of his life. Uh, he was a fighter. As I said, he refused to bend. That's why I mentioned the name of the horse he won the guineas, that we won the guineas with. It was a Moigler colt. He just refused to give in. He refused to, to, to lie down under it. And I said, he, he did the exact, remember this time last year, he hoped to ride, ride actually in the charity race, the Legends race, which was the race to start her off to raise the two and a half million for cancer research. But he, he fought it, that's the best way to put it. He fought it hard. Mm. And that's why I feel so sad because he fought so hard, he deserved to live longer for his three wonderful children and his dear wife. That's Dermot Well talking about his stable jockey, Pat Smullen, and um, it was a year to the day after the Pat Smullen Champions Race for Cancer Trials, uh, 15th of September 2019. These Keep Cups were one of the fundraising initiatives that they had, and I, I think um, so. The, the racing stuff there, Johnny, is fairly amazing to hear from Dermot Well, putting him in the top six jockeys in the world. For anybody in uh, Ireland to be at that level in any of their sports, you realise is, is pretty vaunted company. But actually, I think the point you made earlier on is the stuff off the track that in some ways is going to have the longest legacy because uh, unfortunately loads of people go through tragedies in their lives but they don't always turn it into something that is meaningful and that has the potential to pay it forward. Raising money for research is uh, is difficult to go out there and tell everybody, look, this is a disease and you know uh, I'm suffering with it at the moment. but. Actually, you know what, if we all come together, then who knows, maybe by sharing information and by backing science, maybe at some point down the road, there might be a cure for this. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that you showed the Keep Cup there. I was just getting a cup of coffee this morning and Pat Smullen's face just popped out in the Keep Cup. And uh, I think there'll be an awful lot of homes around Ireland and even elsewhere where Pat Smullen will be in the home for a long time because that beautiful Keep Cup that they sold, I think there were 10 or each and they sold loads of them at the at Champions Weekend's. Um, I think Birdie did the images uh, that he's a well-known racing um, uh, scribbler and he, he put together these beautiful images of them. But, um, you know, I, I, I'd actually kind of half forgotten what Darren was saying there, that Pat was intending to ride in that race. And um, you can imagine if he were, because it was, the emotions that day as it was were just literally up at 100% at the car. It was, it, was a, it was a very, very, it was a day when, you know, it was an abstract in, its, in itself. It just took on a completely different level. And the money's raised, you know, I, I, I look at people like Colin Murray, we'll say, and Doddy Weir, who got motor neuron disease, and um, they would be among those who who are fighting a, a horrific, horrific debilitating disease, but want to make a difference because... They, first of all, I suppose they want a purpose, but they also look at things differently and say, I, I actually want to make a difference. And Pat made a difference because pancreatic cancer is, you know, the, 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 the prognosis is, is, is almost like a death sentence for so many people. And, uh, you know, he, fought, he, he, he battled on much longer. The odds were against him much, much, much big, very big odds that he got as far as he did. But he wanted to make a difference. And everyone listening right now, has suffered has somebody close to him or her who suffered from cancer or died from cancer because it is all pervasive and the money raised was jaw dropping and you know people within racing some people donated massive massive money you know you, you look at the some of the Arab money that came in to fight this because Pat just galvanized people and if Pat had been an asshole first of all he wouldn't have done this and second of all if he did do it the reaction wouldn't have been what it was but 
I was uh, I don't think anyone's struggle in life um, has ever affected me like like his did purely because it gave perspective and his perspective changed and he he realized that his you know you're you're in your own bubble in life in many respects and um, I think COVID nineteen and lockdown has forced people to look at things differently um, and maybe think that whatever your day to day you know um, kind of raison d'etre is might actually not be the one that is right or might just be one that's different to the one that you could take on and I think Pat basically embrace that life um, has many different strands to it and to look after your family and you know for those kids to lose their daddy um, is is horrific but you know his daughter Hannah put up a tweet saying my hero after he passed away with three beautiful photos of her dad and uh, his legacy is, is going to be incredible and I think I think people in in cancer research the cancer research trials you know all all evidence was that they were absolutely blown away by what he achieved you just do not get money like they did um, because of and I think in terms of racing which you know gets us knockers from time to time um, there was just so much pride in what racing actually did for for cancer research and Pat Spolum wasn't a jockey he was just a, a fundraising icon at that stage and and his the legacy is going to be immense I would hope that um, you know the, the people who look look into cancer research and the, the various bodies in Ireland will honour him in some way because of the role that he played. OK, I think we can hear from uh, Johnny Marta as well, who obviously, so we've, we've heard from the trainer who was responsible for his greatest triumph. Let's hear from one of his rivals. This is Johnny Marta who was speaking to us on OTBAM during the week. He is, he, he was the man in, in the way room, you know, in the end that everybody wanted to be like. Everybody wanted to be like Pat Smullen because, you know, what you got was what you seen. It was just, um, he was just, Hey, he, he he was the main man. But I think when we you know when he started that uh, fundraising, I think uh, outside the racing, you know that uh, all the other people around the world got to see the other side of Pat Smullen. That's still that steely determination. Listen, when he got diagnosed first, it was not a good outcome. You know, we knew it was not going to be a good outcome. But he went through the treatment, and we, uh, I genuinely thought this guy is going to pull through. You know this. It's not going to beat this guy. It's just another hurdle that's coming his way. He's going to overcome it. I met him at a couple of functions. You know, in the last two years, he seemed in great form. All was very positive. All was very positive. His mind was always very positive. And then to go and do the fundraising, to start, you know, to create the race, the race that brought together all the champions from all, all over, Mackay, Walsh, Charlie Swan, Paul Carberry, you know, no one else would have done that only for Pat Smullen. You, would, you wouldn't have done it for anybody else. So I think that's that's what he had. He had that. Um, and listen, I, I talk. Listen, he's he's, he's going to, he's, he's going to come through. He's going to come through. But you know, it was only last week speaking to Kevin O'Ryan when I said, "Oh, how is Pat?" Just by his reaction, I got the feeling that all was not well. You know, but. Um, it's it's uh, it's listen it's a it's a hammer blow, but I think everybody outside racing got to see the human being he was, the man he was. They got a feel for him, and as I said, you couldn't but just love the guy. You know, as I said, I I had those great battles with him. Uh, we were head to head on many occasions, but deep down, I really loved the guy. It's uh, Johnny Murta talking about the respect, I guess, that his rivals have for the talent and the hard work and the dedication and the sheer bloody-mindedness that um, saw him eke out 1,800-odd victories. I think that was the other thing, like, um, listening to him talk earlier in the interview with Joe and listening to Johnny Murta talk there, that, like, there was a hard edge, as there has to be, to somebody to be an elite sports person who gets to the top eventually and then keeps the elbows out to make sure that you stay there. Yeah, I'd say like Pat was a bit like uh, I was. I was asking um, a fella from Tyrone actually, who I would met last week. Ended up cycling with a guy from Tyrone. I was. I think he's from the same club as Ryan McMenamin. He was saying he was just a different animal on the pitch. Great guy off the pitch. Just he took on a different persona. And um, I think probably people can relate to that. Pat was probably a bit like that as well. You know, there are stories of he was a hard man to ride against. He was really really single minded. He wanted to win, probably at the expense of maybe other things that he should have pursued and enjoyed earlier in his life because racing was was all encompassing and he wanted to win and uh he was a really really tenacious rider you know there was no um he wasn't going to give you an inch if an inch weren't there he wasn't going to um you know 
be, be friendly with you in the race just because he was, um, you, you know, your buddy. And I, I did enjoy that Johnny Mertz, uh, you know, interview during the week because Johnny's just, I mean, so much time for Johnny. I think that the one thing that, that Johnny said there, nobody would have done it. People wouldn't have done it only for Pat. I think Johnny Mertz's respect in, in racing is absolutely massive as well. And the way he's kind of um, turned himself into this brilliant trainer, but also just how well like how likable he is and the effect that he, he leaves in everyone that he gets. But he's honest. And he was saying, as he said in that interview, like we had our battles. We weren't best friends all the time because we were, um, you know, we were really, these are top class riders. They're trying to get to the top. And I spoke to a journalist last night and he said to me, and we're on about pass. And he said, we'd, in 15 years, I think we'd won bad words. And I said, what was that? And he said, oh, there was one day where he was at a race meeting and I asked him after an instant, did his horse clip heels with another horse? And he flipped the lid and he ran off of me. And I said, geez, will you, why don't you calm down? Like, and that was that anyway. And at the end of the race and the man is left in the press room, Pat comes in and it's been on his mind. And he said, I'm sorry, I apologize. And that was just like, that was Pat, you know, he was brilliant to deal with as a journalist and um, not always in the best mood necessarily, but, he knew like even that day he came back to the journalist and felt bad that he'd flipped the lid because and and you forget the the pressure they're under as well jar i mean he or he referenced that in the interview with joe obviously you're riding horses worth fortune races worth so much money and you know so much money on the line for these mega owners and you know you're riding in derbies and all that it, it's very very tough but pat had a conscience and uh i think the last few years of his life that gave a very good indication of just the decency of the man and just where his, his heart was very much in the right place. And yeah, I, I really hope that um, Francis and the family get strength from the very well-meaning and utterly justified kind of regard that, that people will show for him in death. The, out, the outpouring has um, definitely been remarkable. Absolutely. There's, there's one last clip here. And, and it, sorry, integrity was the other thing that Dermot Well spoke about in, in um, his interview with Joe the other night. This is Fran Berry, um, who... I'm pretty sure we're speaking to us from the Smullen House during the week um, in the aftermath of, of the news breaking and one of his best friends and somebody who'd been there and soldiered alongside him and kind of had come up just a couple of years after him really so would have gone up against him as well at the absolute peak of both their careers and uh, no better man to round out this uh, testimony here. This is Fran Berry talking to Joe during the week. I don't know, it's probably like some of them friendships that, that go, we we never, we didn't see eye to eye initially, we used to have a few run-ins and <laughs> uh, uh, just getting going and rivalry and whatnot, and then we just seemed to gel and travel a lot together and he Pat moved up to Kilcullen and uh, we, we travelled more together and uh, Declan McDonough and Kevin Manning and the four of us and just became firm friends over time and, uh, uh, you know, really tough rivalry on the track like the, you know you couldn't make it up how, how you go out and ride against each other try to get rides off each other and then travel racing together and laugh about it on the way home you know it was a unique unique friendship and situation for the four of us not just myself and Pat you know yeah all all kind of um, you know facades are, are, are put in the ground you're seeing you're kind of on top of each other and seeing the real you know the good the bad and the ugly at times of each other and, and Dermot and you mentioned as well talked about his competitive edge which you, you don't really hear so much when he's been interviewed, particularly of late. You know, he's, he's, he's so mild-mannered and modest and, and quietly spoken. So give us a sense of, of the fight that was in him as a jockey. Yeah, do you know what? He just had to had to win every day, Joe, and he wanted to win. And I think it was from where he started at, he, he, it was all or nothing when he left school to go riding. And as he said, said a few, numerous times, and he said it once or twice in interviews, it, it had to work. Mm. And he never took took his foot off the pedal, for fear that if he did, thing, things would drop away. And he brought that to Ross Common on a Monday or Ballinrobe on a Tuesday, and it was the same pass one that you got in Red Ascot on, on, on a big day. You know, he just was so consistent. And I think from the smallest man in racing with a horse training at own it to the largest, uh, they they wanted him because they knew they were getting that commitment. Pancreatic cancer is such a devastating blow. Did you see much of him or talk much to him over the past couple of years? Oh yeah, 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 and uh, you know, like when the diagnosis came through that time, I was in England at the time, and I flew back the next day and went to see him in Vincent's, and uh, you know, like uh, to to see what he went through, and he never once complained. It was just we're getting this treatment, this to plan, this stage, next stage, and when there was a setback, you know, it'd be a blow, but then he'd pick himself up, and um, you know, and 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 I think 
I think the last couple of years, the not riding, but the time he spent with his family, he knew that was looking back at a now precious, precious time, you know. Mm. And uh, I think he really, really appreciated the, to have that opportunity. You didn't make it back to the Curra today, Fran, or did you? I no, I did. I'm, I'm actually back living in Ireland now, so I, I was there, and uh, it was, um, it, it was very touching and 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 so sad in some respects, but. Uh, credit to the whole industry and the, and the current racing community that turned out today it was very fitting, very very fitting. And uh, to, to to go to the car where he basically spent every every morning working and uh, he loved riding out there. He loved doing the work and uh, loved race riding there. So it was just a, a great way, especially with the COVID times that we're in, to for people to just pay their respects. He made a real impression for a quiet man and somebody who wouldn't have tried to garner attention certainly deliberately. Yeah, Joe, you know, the last 24 hours, we just said it all, how popular he was and how much he touched people's lives. And I suppose the one legacy, apart from a wonderful family uh, that he leaves behind him, is that ca cancer trials research. And if that three million euros that he, he put together, which I don't know how do you comprehend that amount of money to be gathered, garnered on one day, contributes to some saving somebody's life or improving the research into pancreatic cancer that we can see progress, I think he will be happy with that you know it's it's his legacy and he was just a really sound wonderful man that that you knew what you see was what you get and he he, he was very good to people and it's just such a, such a loss that's uh, Fran Berry there, a great friend of Pat Smullen talking about the impact that he'd had on his life. And look, maybe the Keep Cup can be reissued, I don't know, or maybe they can, um, when we're all available to go racing again, they can have another race at the Curra and that could become an annual event. And maybe that legacy can become something that lives on into the future. There was one uh, comment on the RIP condolences uh, that I just wanted to read one last time. Come on, Smullen, rest in peace, Pat, and may the memories of your talent and goodness bring some comfort to your loved ones from somebody who signed themselves a Kildare punter. I thought that um, that one, in the in the midst of the thousands, that one, I don't know why it struck me, but it did. But one, to wrap this up, Johnny, one specific singular memory that you'll take from the racing career on the track? Yeah, the, 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 you can definitely relate to that punter because Pat was like, it's kind of a lot of crap said, oh, he always, geez, you know, you, that jockey would always give you the best to, the run for your money or whatever, but Pat did, like he, Pat wasn't interested in riding horses that weren't there to absolutely win and around Galway it was, you know, he was the darling of punters. For, the, the amount of people in Galway who've had a few beers and like maybe things aren't going great, but they're like, should we let, we'll back Smullen in the last for Weld or whatever and Pat Smullen was absolutely uh, an icon in Galway because he was just amazing the way he got horses home. Um, I should mention as well just Jim Bulger, you know, in terms of racing, Jim Bulger's uh, cancer charity stuff as well has been absolutely remarkable. We should definitely not lose sight of the, the good work that's gone on in racing. But my favourite Smullen memory, now that you asked, is it's, it's actually kind of an odd one. It was, a, it was a 50 grand handicap at the Curra. And William McCreary, um, who we've had on a couple of times on the show, he, he trained this horse called Tylery Wonder. And um, he was a bit like a horse that Fran actually used to ride called Osterhazy, who was, uh, Osterhazy was one of these, like, he was a bit of a, a nut job of a horse, like five furlongs, just bang, bang, all or nothing. And Tyler Wonder was kind of like that. And Smolan was off on him one day in 2015, I think, and it was, it was a handicap. He was 16 to 1, so he wasn't, wasn't fancied. And he was drawn completely the wrong side. So he was drawn, like, away from the stands in maybe a 16, 20 runner race. And Smolan got him out. And towards the end of the race he'd actually bagged the rail so he'd basically done this like almost like a 45 degree angle across the field using a horse's sort of natural pace without kind of killing his energy towards the end of the race and then a 16 to 1 shot who had absolutely no right to win Smullen got him home and I always I remember thinking at the time maybe it was just me that 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 had a special kind of regard for that ride but I thought in terms of tactical brilliance and natural horsemanship from a guy who was self-proclaimed as not the most talented in the world, I thought it was absolutely awesome. And um, if you if you if you have the, the various websites, you can look back on that ride. But for me, that was my favourite. And I think uh, because of what Fran Berry was saying there as well, Jerry, you know, it's not about Harzan really. It's not about it's about the horses that he rode in Sligo or in Ballinrobe or or in Wexford or in these country tracks. Because Matt's, Pat Smullen was the same to an owner in a naught to 60 as he was to the Aga Khan and he was the same to that horse he just wanted to win and every race was a winning opportunity for him yeah and look Joe made the comparison um, uh, with Roy Keane Roy Keane obviously you know never, everybody always said not, never the most talented but actually to reach that level where you're one of the best in the world um, 
you know, we, we really want to send our condolences uh, to the family and to everybody involved in racing because really, truly, the sport has lost one of its greats. And um, if anybody wants to share any memories, feel free to do so. And, um, you know, I think RIP, the, the website, and leave your condolences on that. You know, I think that certainly, as you said, it is something that brings some comfort to families at this moment where they aren't able to see the surge of people that would be at this funeral. I have no doubt that it would have been well, one of the I, biggest I funerals. I suppose, yeah, on that as well, um, you can imagine the, you know, you can just imagine where the families, where their head is at the moment. And when they do get time to reflect and look back on the RIP.ie condolences messages, there will be people from people that Francis, there will be messages from people that Francis will have forgotten and they will bring back memories of, oh yeah, that's what Pat did and, There'll probably be from all over the world. Pat touched me in this way, or Pat touched me in that way, or Pat wrote a winner for me, uh, such and such and down Pat. You're going to get all these beautiful messages that will actually um, revive memories that might have been lost in Francis and the family. And I think that'll be beautiful as well because Pat's dead, but he has to live on as well. And, uh, you know, he has to live on in our memories because uh, we're all the better for that. And the family will certainly be, be clinging to that as well. All right, uh, Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Uh, we were unlucky last week. Fernando Vici was outside the places at Leopardstown on Saturday, which leaves the Tote Irish Injured Jockeys Fund at €2,090. Euro. This weekend, we have another €100 euro back courtesy of Tote. Sunday sees the Listole Harvest Festival get underway. Tote.ie customers can enjoy the Tote versus SP price guarantee on all races. Check out Tote.ie for more. What's our tip this week, Johnny? Well, it's it has to be uh, one from the Derma Well Yard, Ildama in the 310 at Gorn. Um, needless to say, a, you know, a horrific week for the stable. Um, and this is a horse that I think Pat would have certainly been happy to get up in the morning to, to ride. She's a very good chance. I, she's a, she's a quite a classy horse as well. Taking on a couple of uh, more battle-hardened horses from Ado McGuinness and Johnny Murta's yard. Johnny Murta's horse, uh, Lord Rathgallion, um is gonna is gonna have a big chance, but without uh, without in any way knocking Johnny's competitive spirit, I think he wouldn't be overly disappointed if Derma Well beats him with Eldama here, uh, and uh, this could be one for for the Well Stable. I think she's a great chance. That's in Gorn tomorrow, uh, in the three ten, and that was a track that Pat rode extremely well in. He was he was a brilliant brilliant front running rider, and if if, he, if Pat Smullen were out in front and something, and you were behind him, that's where you stayed most of the time. And Kabir, what uh, kind of price do you think? Um, I did the I did the price in the racing post. Think about thirteen days. Um, so, uh, apologies on the Fernando Vici. He came in fourth. He kind of just looked a bit too slow in the race, but uh, that won't be a problem for her. She's a little bit inexperienced, but she's loads of ability, and will be getting weight off the other two who count in the race. So maybe maybe seven to four. You might even get two to one. All right, Johnny. Good stuff. Thanks very much for that. Friday night racing sir. every Friday is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. We're live at three o'clock on the OTV Sports app, and then of course at eight o'clock on Off the Ball on News Talk as well. We'll see you next week. Best of luck. Friday night racing on Off the Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.